to keep track of who's coming and you know sort of show that people are coming and that we can keep getting funding. So be sure to sign. Um, I also want to thank the Center for Ancient Studies for helping fund it. Um, they have uh, you know allowed us to have a wonderful lunch uh, today. Uh, so our speaker today is Dr. Scott Hudson from the University of Kentucky, and he's been working in the northern Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, he's an archaeologist and an anthropologist. He's currently director of the Uki Kansakab Regional Integration Project uh, in uh, northern Yucatan. He's also worked at the site of Chinchu Camino, uh, which I believe will be presenting uh, some data from that project on uh, ancient Mayan neighborhoods today. Um, he's also co-authored and, and authored a, a few uh, very interesting books, Reading the Past with Ian Hodder, and also um, uh, Dwelling Identity in the Mind, which is a, a book that I've enjoyed very much. Um, so I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Scott Hudson today, and uh, he'll be speaking to us about Chin Chuk Mir. Thank you very much, Whit, for that uh, introduction, and thanks also to you and, and Tiffany for helping cover the logistics of my trip, um, dealing with the, how to get the flight purchased and all that. Um, this is a huge pleasure, a huge pres uh, kind of pleasure for me to be able to speak here at the, in the museum and the Department of Anthropology at Penn, in part because so much of research that I build on has been conducted by archaeologists and anthropologists associated over the last 50 years or so with the University of Pennsylvania. And you know, Whit mentioned to me last night that if there is some kind of general theme of this year's colloquium, it's sort of like celebrating a hundred years of anthropology at Penn. So so serendipitously my sort of attempt to, to highlight how Penn's contributions have shaped my research kind of falls in line a little bit with this celebration of the history of the department. All right, so um, my, my, my research in Yucatan involves um, settlements at a variety of scales, uh, little rural house lots, small villages, towns, and even some, some big cities. Looking at the cities is potentially really exciting because um, for at least a century now, um, a lot of researchers, just one of which I'm going to focus on here, Jane Jacobs, have talked about how getting a, a lot of people in a small space, well, we'll have, you know, an urban center, can be a real um, generator. It can sort of um, uh, create efficiencies, um, enhance productivity. It can be a source of innovations, unexpected encounters between people. And just, just kind of for, for fun, something I was reading just the other day, a couple people have been arguing that in ancient and modern cities, um, productivity increases at a faster rate than the growth of cities itself. So there's kind of like a multiplier effect in cities, which makes them so dynamic. And so as, as archaeologists, cities are an important locus of study just because of the transformations that can come from them. Um, but cities also have a lot of downsides. And so my talk, in a, in a nutshell, is about um, how one particular intermediate scale social unit, the neighborhood, can kind of mitigate some of these downsides of, of city living. In particular, neighborhoods make large, intimidating places a little bit more livable. Um, in ancient cities, specifically in the Maya area, it's pretty hard to detect some of these intermediate scale social units. Um, but the research that I'm going to talk about at Chinchuk Mill, we've been able to take advantage of some spatial features that makes it a little bit easier to actually divvy up a city into potential, potentially meaningful ancient social units. And once we're able to divvy it up like that, we can actually begin to look at how these social units, um, what role they might have played politically, economically, socially, in the, the production and reproduction of cities. So uh, I'm going to begin with this term, urbanism. Um, I get my definition from uh, Lewis Wirth, kind of an old school definition. Urbanism is a condition in which masses of people are both socially distant but physically close. And so there are three key components to this definition. One is that there's lots of people. Number two is that they're physically close, that there's dense settlement. And number three, that they're socially distant, which I like to gloss as social differentiation. This could be in terms of occupational specialization, it could be in terms of wealth or status. Now in the Maya area, um, 
most of the well-known archaeological sites, the ones with the, the big temples, a lot of archaeologists well into the 60s weren't willing to consider these, these sites as cities. Um, that's because they were the, these large sites with big temples were said to be vacant ceremonial centers, and that the actual population consisted of egalitarian farmers that was evenly spread across the, uh, the hinterlands. And so one of the projects that really helped change this understanding of large Maya sites was the Tikal project, obviously, uh, University of Pennsylvania venture. Um, and so mapping efforts by Carl Hazard, T. Call Report 11, as well as work by Dennis Puliston, T. Call Report 13, as well as lots of household and residential excavations throughout the site, uh, established beyond doubt that cities like T. Call had appreciable social differentiation, both in terms of different kinds of specialists, as well as different uh, levels of wealth and power. And they also had lots of people. Even so, a lot of archaeologists, continuing to this day, doubt whether Maya cities have this second component, dense settlement. And some of that doubt comes from comparison to other cities in central Mexico, like Teotihuacan, as well as old world cities. Um, Rome comes to mind. Cities that have, let's say, 5,000 people per square kilometer or more. Uh, and so only, only two, you know, up until maybe the 90s, 90s or so, there were a couple of Maya cities recognized to have that kind of high density. Mayapan being one of them, but a lot of people dismissed this because Mayapan was a late city with Mexican influence. Copan is another city with high density, but if that high density is concentrated into a rather small area. Um, but a lot of archaeologists have kind of embraced this low density urbanism idea and kind of rebranded it. So in, instead of being kind of marginalized from urban studies because Maya cities are always kind of prefaced by a qualifier, like garden cities or regal ritual cities. Um, some archaeologists have said, well, this is, this is actually a really neat phenomenon, low-density urbanism. It's not just in the Maya area. It's also in other parts of the tropics, like Angkor Wat. And these low-density cities, ancient cities, can actually be compared with contemporary suburban sprawl. And so there's a few articles about talking about how uh, to what degree was sustainability of ancient low-density cities comparable to sustainability of contemporary cities. My take goes sort of in the other direction. So Whit mentioned that I worked a lot at a site called Chunchuk Mil. Chunchuk Mil, as we now know, but we didn't know until maybe a decade ago, is an extremely densely populated Maya city. And so it really does have the dense settlement that, that, that makes, these makes up a classic definition of urbanism. Uh, other cities that have had better mapping projects in the last 10, 15 years have revealed other dense settlements. Palenque is a good example, very densely occupied. And so um, if we look at some of those Maya cities, some of those ancient cities that have rather dense settlement, this can kind of spur a bit of a research question. Um, if people in densely populated ancient Maya cities suffers from some of the maladies of historically known cities, what helped them cope? So what are these maladies? What are some of these disadvantages? Um, it's, it's a common trope in, in literature to, uh, to complain about city life. And so people from walks of life as varied as, uh, people as varied as John Ruskin and Friedrich Nietzsche, Oswald Spengler, um, Ebenezer Howard, all kinds of people have talked about why cities are so bad. And uh, Georg Simmel um, ha has a neat take that, 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 is, that I'll just kind of present to you a little bit. So Simmel argued that in these areas that have a bunch of, um, where multitudes of strangers are kind of thrusted together, the sense of anonymity leads to psychological anxiety and sort of despair and even, even terror. And so people have to kind of uh, develop a sort of a, a bearing of aloofness or sort of a studied reserve to just get by in day-to-day -day life. And, and so, so these cities, they do, on the one hand, according to people like Zimmel, um, emancipate their occupants from the, from the overbearing kinship burdens of, of village life, but only at the expense of a loss of rootedness or loss of tradition. And so, so this notion of urban anomie kind of comes forward. 
Uh, of course, p cities where there's lots of people living close together, especially in the tropics, especially in the lowland tropics, also have health problems, particularly in cities without sanitation. Um, in the New World, there's no, uh, no exception here. Uh, diseases can spread more quickly. We have very high mortality rates as seen in cities like Teotihuacan and Copan. In fact, demographers have this, this, this principle they call the law of natural urban decrease. And the, the, this law is that cities are so unhealthy to live in that, uh, at least in, you know, prior to advanced sanitation, that cities, simply to maintain their population, have to recruit migrants from the countryside just, just, to, just to survive. Um, so a couple of archaeologists, people like George Kogel, who's worked a lot in Teotihuacan, have begun to ask, um, what, in the face of these problems, what is it that could potentially attract people from the countryside to come to these big metropolises? What things in cities make that life livable? And so there's all kinds of answers. Um, I have a couple listed here. Marketplaces, um, enchanting built form, spectacles. But uh, some ethnographic work in places like Mexico City uh, gives a background for, for the one sort of, the thing I'm going to focus on today, neighborhoods. They say that um, a lot of these ethnographies show that um, very close, uh, socially integrated communities can spring up within cities that mitigate uh, this notion of anomie and rootlessness and, and um, disintegration, lack of integration. So what is a neighborhood? Um, I follow a couple people. One of them is um, a guy named Mike Smith. A neighborhood is an area that is home to people that interact with each other on a face-to-face -face basis and see their area as distinctive. The sort of positive aspects, the, the attraction of neighborhoods is that they, um, this face-to-face this -face interaction creates a degree of mutual familiarity between residents that creates networks of trust that allow, um, that, that make, make the place more safe both for residents and for outsiders and these networks of trust and mutual familiarity um, also uh, counteract the compartmentalization of supposedly anonymous urban life. Um, <coughs> Neighborhoods have kind of gotten to be a, gotten to be a pretty exciting um, topic. Specifically, when I talk uh, more specifically, or maybe less specifically, um, intermediate scale social units, intermediate you know, above the level of the household and below the level of the city as a whole. Uh, and I want to talk about why research on neighborhoods and other kinds of communities like this has gotten to be pretty interesting. And so, at least in the Maya area, the history, the discipline. Um, began as a focus on palaces and elites and, and kings. Um, one of the contributions of the Tikal project was excavations in non-elite contexts, residential areas. Um, ex excavations by William Haviland, Marshall Becker. This one just came out in 2014, and there's still that the, that Tikal project is still bearing quite a bit of fruit. And so by the 1980s, this whole thing of household archaeology was really well established, and it helps us really get at cities from the bottom up, from uh, looking at household economies uh, and how they contribute to, the, the, to, to a site as a whole. Um, in the 80s, Wendy Ashmore, another uh, Penn professor, was very much a part of this um, 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 popularization uh, of, of household archaeology. But above the level of the household and below the level of the site as a whole, there's still an important sort of stratum there that, 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 that might be missing. We want to know precisely how do households articulate with, 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 um, with the, 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 the broader context of the city. Um, how do households form coalitions that give those households a voice in city politics? And, and how do city managers, administrators, uh, divide up cities into kind of um, more feasible units of administration. So, so that, that's why sort of these intermediate scale social units like neighborhoods have come to be popular. Um, in 2000, a pair of um, 
graduate students that were then at the University of Pennsylvania, Marcello Canuto and Jason Yeager, published a book called Archaeology of Communities, edited a book, I should say. And this was a real landmark. It really kind of, um, kind of, uh, sort of, um, really gave a good stimulus to sort of community type studies above the level of the household. And their definition of a community is a little bit verbose, um, but it's, it's very similar to a neighborhood. At, at the risk of sort of insulting your intelligence, I have a very simple chart here explaining the relationship between the two. Neighborhoods are just one form of community. And um, they are pretty specific. Uh, neighborhoods require face-to-face -face interaction. Not all communities do so. You, know, you can have imagined communities. Um, neighborhoods are at a certain scale if face-to-face -face interaction is the basis of, 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 of how people, of, of what, what makes a neighborhood, you have a kind of an upper limit as to how large the neighborhood can be. You know, how many people can you really know on a face-to-face -face basis? Whereas communities can be imagined as, as entire cities. So communities are also a, a, a smaller version, sorry, neighborhoods are at, perhaps at the small end of all the different kinds of communities. Um, they're, they're all, there's another term I want to talk a little bit about, district. This is sort of like a neighborhood, um, but it's a bit different. So district is also an area that's home to people that may not interact with each other on a face-to-face -face basis, but does see their areas distinctive. So it's a, it's, a, it's a recognizable social unit that is um, maybe at a scale higher than the neighborhood, but still at the scale below the city as a whole. So, um, Jaeger and Canudo uh, identified an interesting problem for, for research on things like neighborhoods and communities. And that problem is that we can't assume that neighborhoods are natural or essential, which means we can't really predict exactly what characteristics they're going to have. Um, so, in terms of trying to find, this is actually a, a term that not, a number of other people have used when the astronauts used it. But, um, the focal node here seems to be an elite residence that also has a large platform that could have been a, a center for um, neighborhood uh, ceremonies or, or feasts. So, so I think these are good examples of neighborhood. They, kind of, they seem to exemplify the three characteristics of the definition. But the, the tricky part is that if you look at the whole map of Tsibototun or the whole map of Tikal, you can kind of cherry pick a couple of examples that seem to be spatially distinct, but for the most part, you can't use this criteria to systematically um, understand spatial divisions at the site. And so that's where um, some of my and my colleagues' research at Chunchuk Meal comes in. Chunchuk Meal, as I'm going to explain in just a second, has some spatial features that allows us to kind of be more systematic about. Um, uh, about encountering uh, neighborhoods and districts. So um, Bruce Dahlin initiated work at Chinchuk Mill in 1993. He started as a Penn graduate student, but ended up finishing at Temple. Uh, he, he noted that Chinchuk Mill, which is a large city, as I'll show you in a second, was located in an area of the Maya world that received very little precipitation. And um, beyond that, the soils were thin, and for about anywhere from 25 to maybe a third of the land surface in this area was just, just bedrock. So, um, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging area to feed a lot of people, and particularly challenging to feed a city. I noticed that the, the landscape here is basically flat, and so all the maps I'm going to show you from now on um, don't show any topography. That's because there really isn't any. It's just a flat plain, basically. No rivers, no hills. Um, so that's that. Uh, so we, we so that, that was sort of Bruce's idea to try to figure out how does the how did this city support itself. Um, the city takes its name from the village of Chuchuk Mill, which is located just a little bit to the uh, to the west. All these are modern villages. We started out by trying to map a 16 square kilometer block, just like they did at Tikal. Um, the land that pertains to this 16 square kilometer block is actually owned slash claimed by five different land-holding institutions, uh, and some of it is sort of disputed. So I owe a, a large uh, debt, a large debt of gratitude and thanks to 
there are really dozens of um, dozens of local officials, Edo officials, that um, helped facilitate our research. What we were able to end up to, to map in the end was about 12 square kilometers. Um, we you know, kind of switched the plan midstream when we realized we couldn't fill out the whole block. We decided to do these kind of transects. Uh, I'm going to focus just on a sort of a nine and a half square kilometer polygon in the center here. And so our mapping, there's was, was a lot of mapping. It was over 10,000 structures that we mapped. Um, these structures group into about 1,400 architectural compounds. And um, the mapping work began in 1996, and we chipped away at it over the course of 10 field seasons. We finished in 2006. And so a lot of people were involved in this. Uh, here's a list of um, the people who did some of the work. Uh, the people at the top did more of it than others. I did most of it. Well, not most of it. I did, I did oh, whatever. Uh, somebody, somebody uh, Jamie Ford is in the audience right there. He's a, um, a fellow at the Center for Early American Studies here at Pennsylvania. He, he did some of the mapping. Um, is this whole map contemporaneous? Is, 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 do, is everything that we find on the map, was it actually all occupied at one point in time? Is this an actual portrait of a city as it existed at one point in time? The short answer is yes. In addition to the mapping, we did a, about 170 test pitting operations, divided up across the site, um, tried to stratis, stratify these operations by square kilometer block, as well as by size of the architectural compound. And the ceramics indicate that, that just about each, just about every one of these compounds um, would, had its major occupation in the middle of what we call the classic period. So that's basically the 5th and 6th centuries AD. The 6th century was when the, when the site was really, really booming. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a very short tour of what this site looks like at a, at a smaller scale. So there's a kind of a site center if we zoom in, I used this slide in the presentation here at Penn four years ago at my meeting, so I, I know one or two of you have seen it already. Uh, if you look at the site core, it's, it's dense enough that it's hard to see, it's hard to make sense of, so I'm going to highlight just the, the large pyramids here in blue, and um, also highlight in red plazas that abut the pyramids. There's also a system of causeways which connect some of these monumental architectural compounds. You see on the edges of the site core, there are a lot, of, a lot of smaller platform groups. That's part of what we call the residential core, um, which has a very high settlement density, about 950, usually <coughs> residences per square kilometer. And we zoom in, this is kind of what it looks like. Each one of these white sort of compounds generally consists of a low platform that supports five or six or three or four or seven or eight smaller structures on top of it. But the neat thing in this map are these yellow dotted lines. I'm going to zoom in a little further to another part of the site uh, to give you a, a, a closer view. So these yellow lines are basically little stone walls. They do two things. They encircle um, domestic compounds, but they also make pathways through the site. I've got these pathways kind of highlighted here in red. This is what they look like on the ground if you're just mapping them. So it's a, uh, this is what the pathways look like. So it's a pair, you know, a pair of we call them albaradas. They're just parallel. Uh, if you were to reconstruct one of these um, pathways, it would look a little bit like this. And these are the spatial features that help us get a better understanding of spatial divisions within the site. I'll return to that in a second. Um, beyond the residential core is an area we call the residential periphery. Uh, much lower settlement density. And as you can see, because the density is lower, they don't um, have nearly as many of these pathways. But I'm going to focus from now on just, just on the sort of the, really the residential core of the site. This map just shows all the structures. I'm going to replace it with a map that just shows the pathways. This is a little bit like a road map. Um, it may seem kind of confusing, but there's actually quite a bit of structure to it. 
which I'll get into in a second. And it's also pretty unique among the ancient Maya world. Uh, there are definitely roads and causeways in other Maya sites. So here's an example, Tikal. I've highlighted um, some of its major causeways. But at Tikal, these causeways don't really penetrate very far into the residential parts of the city. So they don't help us that much in, in, in looking at broader scale site structure. Um, let me go over to another site called Karakol. This is sort of the monumental core here. At Karakol, a system of causeways does indeed penetrate much further into the residential areas of the site. This map was produced by a pair of Pennsylvania PhDs, uh, Arlen Chase and Diana Chase, um, who have also hypothesized or, or argued for the existence of um, satellite marketplaces usually associated with one of these causeways that branches out into the city. And so the chases have made an argument that, that, that we have possible city sectors where people who, are, who frequent the same marketplace come to know each other, that it's, sort of, that, that it's a foundation for face-to-face -face social interactions. But the difficulty is actually trying to, to make spatial division. So we, you know, if we wanted to try to divide this into social spatial units, we could do something like this, um, but we could just as well do it like this, uh, or maybe like this. Um, or if we want to be more conservative and just highlight an area that's immediately around one of the markets and their um, adjoining causeways, we could come up with a map like this. But still, if there's, if there's a house lot uh, that, that's located somewhere out here in the void, in between, let's say, the Puchituk market and the Seba market, without having some system of pathways, we don't know, when, you know how easy it is for this group, to, for the people living here, to get to one marketplace or the other. We don't know, you know where they're, you know, what is their, their, their neighborhood, so to speak. So it's, so it's sort of like, here's kind of a weak analogy, but it's, it's kind of like trying to figure out neighborhoods based by, by looking only at a map of, of interstate highways. And so, so if we go back to Chu Chu Meal, um, because these, these pathways are a lot more, well, there's just a lot more of them, um, we can do a lot more. There is a bit of structure. It may look kind of, kind of confusing, but there is some structure here. And the structure I'm going to point out is that I call it a kind of a hub and spoke. So I presume that there's a, a kind of a, the site core is sort of the hub. And coming out of that site core, there are these spokes. Um, and what's missing are sort of bridging pathways, sort of like beltways, so to speak. So if you live, for example, on this, what I call a spoke, there's no pathway that can send you directly over to the neighboring spoke, or directly over to that neighboring spoke. So you really only have a couple of choices available to you. You can, you can either, go, if, you, if, you're, if you live here and you want to go over there, you basically have to go down to the center and then out or out, around, and back down. And so these spokes, just the way they're configured, permit a set of divisions. They, these divisions, I hate to say it, but they, they, once we finally kind of put the whole map, to, map together, the divisions almost drew themselves. And from these divisions, we can hypothesize some different um, intermediate scale settlement units, intermediate between the household and the site as a whole. Um, if we are to number these, you can see that some of them are not as convincing as others. For example, what I call spoke cluster, spoke cluster number 13 um, is actually, there's not really a main spoke, I don't think, and it's actually kind of confusing. You can easily get lost in here. Same thing with spoke cluster 12. But there is really no way to walk from spoke cluster 13 up to 14 or down to 12 except for going, well, except for that one little spot. You're going to have to go to the center and out. So these, so even the kind of more ambiguous spoke clusters, I think, do have a kind of a spatial um, dis distinctiveness to them. Now what about, you know, so, 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 so in a social sense, um, I think the way that these spokes are configured really does give us a good argument for face-to-face -face interactions between people who live near each other. Um, in particular, if you live on this spoke cluster, anytime you have to get anywhere, whether it's down to the site core or maybe out somewhere else, 
you're going to be walking along that same pathway that's shared by the same people, so bumping into the same neighbors over and over again. What is it, though, that might, might give these, these spoke clusters some additional social significance? The answer here I'm proposing is, is some of the monumental architecture at the site. So what these look like, each of these black, um, there's one up there, there's a, a bunch here, each of these black marks on the map uh, refers to basically a single large pyramid. Usually the pyramids are about 10 meters or higher. And these pyramids um, kind of face onto a plaza or, or patio that's usually about 40 meters by 40 meters or, or a little bit bigger. There are some that are a little bit smaller. And so I have this idea that each of these spoke clusters, with some exceptions, but more or less cleanly articulates with one particular monumental compound. Uh, there are definitely some exceptions to the rule, so spoke cluster 13 may have four different compounds um, that it accesses. Uh, clusters 6 and 8, they both sort of, their spoke feeds not really to one of these compounds, but to a causeway. But then again, this no nobody seems to be feeding that one. So maybe the Pomoche compound is affiliated with clusters six and, and eight. So it's, it's so it's so it's not a one to one correlation. But I do think that most of these spoke clusters actually have a kind of a, a place where occasional ceremonies, rituals, feasts, other things um, would happen, and basically everybody from that spoke cluster could go there. Would they all fit? So th this gets to, to demography. So we're going to start talking about population. How, how many people live in these things? Um, if, we, uh, if we take the map of just the buildings and overlay the actual spoke clusters onto them, we can kind of count up how many house lots fall within the area of each of these spoke clusters. Um, by house lots, again, I'm referring to these enclosed or mostly enclosed um, domestic groups, which on average have about three and a half uh, residences, and through through some interesting math, you can do a kind of a estimation type conversion of number of house lots to an actual population. And so this is these are some of the numbers we're getting for the amount of people that might have lived in each of these um, spoke clusters. And so if we compare the amount of people per spoke cluster to the amount of people that might have fit in the main plaza of each of those monumental compounds, this is assuming one meter, one square meter per person, that that, that, that that would mean that these are the two columns we have to compare. You know, do does the number of people in each of these spoke clusters is, is it is it small enough to fit in the actual ceremonial space affiliated with that spoke cluster? Um, there is a small kind of positive correlation. Um, there's only one case where there seems to be more people than would fit, you know, drastically more people than would fit at one meter per square, one person per square meter. Uh, but I can I can do some special pleading about <laughs> why this one might work. If, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that a little. Well, I'll keep that to myself. You can ask me about it later. Um, so uh, so I think that each of these spoke clusters are not just. Um, clusters of residences where people are bumping into each other because they're sharing the same transit routes, but there also is something distinctive about them, that they have a kind of a reinforced group identity that comes from attending possible ceremonies at these monumental compounds. Uh, let's look a bit more closer at the, at the scale of these. So I've oriented, or I've arranged them from the smallest at the top to the, to the largest. Um, so the small one is Number five, largest is number twelve. What, what did? How do we interpret these these size ranges? What what kind of analogy could we use to, to figure out if this is if, if this if, if social units of, of these sizes might actually correlate to what what people would recognize as a neighborhood? Um, well, there's the one analogy I'm going to start with is um, towns that had neighborhoods in the colonial period, specifically in the 16th century. 
So here is Chinchwick Mill. It was abandoned in the colonial period. It was actually mostly abandoned by the end of the classic period. Um, but some colonial, some large colonial towns nearby, um, according to ethnohistoric records, these are mostly relaciones that are sent back to the King of Spain. So here's a nearby town that had three hundred five barrios, each with 350 people. Here's one, Tequit, said to have two barrios, barrios loosely translated as a kind of a, kind of a neighborhood, um, 1,100 people per barrio. Uh, Pencuyut, another community not far away, uh, three barrios, 400 people per barrio. The last one, Peto, um, about 800 people per barrio. So these figures, 350, 400,000, sort of, sort of fit the range here. Um, what, about, what about some ancient examples? Uh, Copan Valley is, is a case. Richard Leventhal has, worked, has done some of this work here, uh, mapping the Copan Valley. Uh, what Fash identifies as these kind of essentially rural villages um, have a population of about 204 on, on average, but, but these, these are kind of rural villages. They're not really a good analogy to, I think, a, a division within a city. Um, another good example, or maybe a better example, comes from near Chunantini. This is a project that was directed by um, Richard Leventhal and Wendy Ashmore. Jason Yeager is mapping of the San Lorenzo settlement cluster, about a kilometer and a half from the Shunantini site core. This is in Belize. Had made maybe about 150 people. Um, if you go back to Marshall Becker's pottery producing neighborhood at Tikal, about 100 people. So these, these are kind of ancient urban division numbers are getting kind of on the smaller end of what we're finding at Chinchuk Mill. So, so I think that these smaller ones are made, made for, I, I, I think that they could be considered sort of neighborhoods. The larger ones probably, we should call them districts, you know, a bit bigger than a neighborhood. I think these, these districts um, would have had divisions within them. So if we look at District 14, just the configuration of the, the pathways allows you to suggest some possible subdivisions, 14A, B, C, and D, um, possible subdivisions over here, and, Cluster nine. Um, I, I put them all of them within the same spoke cluster because they each feed to to one single monumental compound. So one other way we might be able to come up with subdivisions within um, within these larger spoke clusters is to look at sort of open spaces within them. Now there's not 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 flat, not form not the formal plazas that are part of the the monumental architectural compound but just sort of open, unbuilt spaces within the residential areas. Um, I'm not going to go into this as much as I planned to, because I've got, I think, some stuff I want to say that's, that excites me a bit more. But So I'm just going to, just don't pay attention <laughs> to, to this stuff. So there are open spaces within these, and there are some patterns to it. But uh, anyway, I, I'm going to move from here and, and sort of say that, that, that at Chunchuk Meal, we have identified some neighborhoods and some districts. So now the question to ask is, what does this tell us about the city as a whole? What are these neighborhoods like? What, 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 are, what are they for? Um, so one question you could ask is, are there possible economic resources that anchors each of these possible um, spoke clusters, neighborhoods or districts. Um, you know, do, is, is, is neighborhood one, are those the, are those the polychrome potters at Chuchu Um No. But, but uh, so, so a, couple, a couple of like resources that, uh, that I want to look at are Sascaveras. These are basically kind of lime quarries. Um, you, uh, Sascav is a kind of a friable limestone used to make things like plaster. There are about 250 of these, these quarries, but they're spread pretty evenly across the site. So, so no, no particular neighborhood is like the Sascabera Central. Um, wells, that water sources, this is maybe a, a somewhat more likely possible resource, specifically in light of some ethnographic work that's been done in the Highland Maya area by Evan Vogt. So in Highland Chiapas, around the town of Sinacantan, Vote looked at this community called Paste. Here's a map of the community. The community is divided into waterhole groups. 
So there are six water holes that vote maps, and each water hole group is composed of a handful of lineages that all get their water from that same water hole. So that, that, that's a possible grounds for everyday interaction, kind of fetching what meeting at the well. Um, but beyond that, these water hole groups, they take their, their name comes from the water hole. Their water hole has a special kind of spirit that you know, every couple of, two or three times a year, everybody in the water hole group goes to these water holes, cleans them out, performs different rituals, ceremonies, processions. So water, water is, is, is really a core of neighborhood identity. If you're at the vote, then you can ask these people, what, what water hole do you pertain to? And so this is the map that he was able to draw up. And this is unfortunate from an archaeological perspective because um, distance measures won't work. Let's say you're lineage number two as part of water hole group three, right there. Um, you are located very close to water hole two, but you actually fetch your water from water hole three. So, so this is, if you don't have the people to ask what are the boundaries, it's, it's hard to do at a place like Chuchuk Meal. This is a map I'm overlaying the 18 wells we found throughout the site. Um, a couple problems come up initially. Not all, not all areas of the site have a well. Maybe, maybe they did and it's since been kind of filled in with dirt and stone. We didn't find it on the survey. That, that's very possible. Um, but maybe more difficult to move from water holes as a kind of a source, a, a, a natural resource around which an identity can congeal. More difficult is the fact that a lot of these wells, specifically uh, 4, 6, 7, 11 out of 18 are actually located within somebody's house lot, like within their little, their little boundary wall. So they're, they seem to be a bit more private than they are public. Just for kicks, I thought I'd throw up a, uh, an image that shows um, the percentage of, uh, percentage of ceramic uh, debris that represents jars from each of the places we excavated. So a big green dot means lots of water jars. I wanted to see if there's some, some spatial relation between the people with a lot of water jars and the wells. And I don't think there's, I don't think there's either, well, Statistically, there's neither a positive or negative correlation. So it's not that people who live farthest away have the most water jars, or the people who live right near these have a lot of water jars. So, so that's it for water. Um, actually, we also wanted to, so is there a correlation between low, oh, well, no. Um, I also wanted to look at, you know, just, just, just for the fun of it, do people that live right around these wells, are they somehow wealthier? So wealth, as measured by proportion of your ceramic assemblage that is that comprises um, fancy ceramics, uh, polychromes, fine wares. Again, there doesn't seem to be a strong pattern. And this gets to the, the broader question of how is wealth distributed around the site spatially? Are some neighborhoods the wealthy neighborhoods, whereas others are less well off? So um, if you look at just wealth as indicated by access to fancy pottery, I don't think there are any wealth-based spatial um, divisions. You can see that households that had a decent amount of fancy pottery are found in basically all of the spoke clusters. Um, what if we measure wealth in terms of um, architecture? This notion that living in larger and fancier buildings with, with, with higher basal platforms implies more control of natural resources, more control of labor? I think the answer there um, is also no. Let me get into this more specifically. So here are some examples of what we call sort of wealthy households, just based on the architecture alone. What they have are many more platforms, which probably means more people, but more people is more labor, that's a resource. But also a lot of the platforms are higher up off the ground, so moving up, moving a lot more stone. Um, most of these, what we call elite households, have a four or five or six meter high sort of shrine in them. Um, so, so let's look at the distribution of these kind of elite households throughout the site, correlate them to the spoke clusters. So here's, here's all, the, all the households with domestic shrines of, of higher than five meters. Um, we find that there isn't really a, a, a real neighborhood of of, of powerful households. They're, they're pretty well 
not 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 evenly distributed, but but perhaps um, somewhat randomly distributed. If we throw on all the households with domestic shrines between four and five meters high, so not quite as big, but still requires a lot of labor, uh, the pattern is almost the same. We see these um, richer households pretty evenly distributed throughout the site. And what I think is really interesting is that, so what this means is that along the same spoke cluster, neighbors are going to be of very different levels of prosperity. So measured by poverty, no, as measured by architecture, no. But this, this, this question of different levels of, of different levels of prosperity on the same in the same neighborhood is pretty well illustrated by this slide here. So here's the, the in in paint graphs sort are of the main the main spoke. This house lot here has four very low circular apsidal structures. This one here, which is just across the street, that, that's sort of its driveway right there. This one here, just across the street actually has a more or less formally built low basal platform and a household shrine. That one measures about two meters high. And then just one house lot over, we have this house lot, which has two formal patios, um, a five meter high household shrine. So people of different, um, of, of very different available resources would have been kind of bumping into each other on these same um, Pathways. So neighborhoods were heterogeneous in terms of status. All right, let's uh, let's let's wrap this up. Where where have we gone? What's next? Oh, actually, one more point here. So the last thing I wanted to look at for this particular talk is um, is there some kind of stylistic difference? You know. At, 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 at the central Mexican city of Teotihuacan, there's one neighborhood that has a lot of Oaxacan pottery that seemed, it turns out to be an ethnic barrio. Do we see that kind of thing at Chinchwood Meal? So I, I created a number of maps like this that show different kinds of pottery that are not, not necessarily fancy pottery to see if there was one part of the site that had a lot of pottery of one particular type versus another part of the site that had a lot of pottery from a different, let's say, red painted type. And the answer was basically, no, um, we don't have sort of stylistic ceramic differences across the site. But there are some interesting differences. Typically, these pathways are made just by two parallel stone walls. But there's another kind. There's Jamie Ford. Um, another kind that have a sort of a low stone pavement in between the, the, the two bounding walls. We call these things cheech, cheech bays. They're basically like gravel causeways. And so if you look at a map of the site where we just highlight the gravel causeway, the, the cheech bays, um, and, and disappear all the sort of normal pathways, we see that there's quite a bit of clustering of these gravel things in the south part of the site. And, and, and you know, overlaps pretty well with these two spoke clusters. And over here on the east part of the site, that's a kind of a, a local concentration of people who decided to make, make cheech bays as opposed to regular paths. Just about everybody living in this little, little area here has their buildings oriented to the same uh, angle. So, so I think there is some kind of minor um, stylistic differentiation uh, to be found across the site and, and that, that patterns out spatially. You know, one area of the site prefers this kind of construction. The other area you know, decides to orient their structures along the same, same way. Okay, now, conclusion, conclusions. So, um, uh, so I've been looking at, trying to look for intermediate scale social units across the site of Tunjuk Mill. I, I think we've found them. We've found um, areas that are spatially discrete, that because of int frequent interactions along pathways that they're kind of forced to have because the pathways don't give them any choices where to walk, we get some repeat, repetitive face-to-face -face interactions. And I think that the people living on that, 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 that spoke cluster, the people interacting, are also um, participating in some of the actual kind of identity, community-affirming rituals uh, at these monumental compounds. 
in terms of size, these things range from about 100 people to 2,000 people. So I think some of these are small enough to what we, what we could call neighborhoods. Others might be um, districts, but with probable subdivisions within them. Um, and so I think that, 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 that these are probably the kinds of social units that would have um, allowed people to find a kind of a real sense of rootedness and a sense of place, even within a large um, city where there are probably 30 to 40,000 people in a large place where most people in the city you don't know. Um, but what, what else are these? Are they just sort of uh, neighborhoods to, 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 to make life a bit more, to make life smaller in a big city, or is there something more to them? And so, in terms of whether they have economic functions, um, do they have, you know, they, uh, do they exist for some corporate kind of economic uh, goal? I don't, I, we haven't been able to detect it. Maybe they did. Maybe it has something to do with salt. That's for another topic, for another day. Um, there's minor evidence of stylistic distinctions, but I don't think that, that, this, that this evidence is strong enough as, say, what we find in Teotihuacan, where there's an actual ethnic barrio. Um, finally, the fact that these things are heterogeneous in terms of wealth and access to resources suggests to me that each of these neighborhoods had some powerful people, had some leaders. And so that brings me to the final, well, one of the final points, political factions. Are these things sort of political factions within the city? Um, I think that's a very likely answer. Uh, how does this mesh with what we know about other Maya cities? Um, most other Maya cities seem to have um, an, an unambiguously clear site core and a ruling dynasty. But toward the end of the classic period, we do have evidence from here and there of sites um, being more cities being more segmentarily organized, uh, multiple political factions. Uh, we don't have these kinds of, um, of wall features, these kind of, kind of pathway features at these other sites. But I think that in these other sites, even though we can't see them, there probably was some agreed upon spatial, um, spatial boundaries. They may have been using perishable shrubs, things like that. So I don't think Chunchuk Meal is necessarily unique. And I think that what we see at Chunchuk Meal, a high degree of possible political factionalism, uh, segmentary political organization, does have analogies in other parts of the Maya area, though a little bit later uh, in time and time, a little bit later toward the, toward the classic period. Um, so let me just um, thank some of my sponsors, not, not just my own, but people who have sponsored Bruce over the years. Um, it's been a long project and we're, we're always happy to share our data. And, and I'd love to take some questions because this is definitely a, a, an evolving kind of line of thought, even though the data has been technically around for almost nine years. Especially on your last point about the political factions, um, if there's any indication of those spoke compounds you were talking about, of those actually sort of influencing the the makeup of these different neighborhoods, if, not to get into like a chicken and the egg kind of question, <coughs> what is the kind of time depth of these compounds in relation to the neighborhoods, and if you think there's any influence from those compounds and people are settling in these neighborhoods. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the, there's, there's a, a couple of really good questions in there. One, um, which was a more um, sort of implicit question, is just what do you know about these compounds? And the, we, we haven't fully, ex we, we've done a major excavation of one of them, um, and it does suggest that these were, that the architecture was definitely set up for um, performances. Uh, but in terms of the time depth, we've got test pits through plazas of, of, all, of all of those uh, monumental compounds. And most of them have very, very little pre-classic pottery. Um, there's one particular area that, uh, well, if we could, yeah. Just, well, maybe this is more detail than we really need. 
probably is more detail than you. But uh, so, um, so, so in sum, we, we can't really answer your question because on the basis of these test pits, we know that in the area where these compounds were later built, there was some debris from earlier periods, but we don't have, these test pits don't give us enough architectural stratigraphy to say exactly when they begin, when, when, the, when the major architectural features began to be built. And so we can't really correlate that with precisely when the accompanying house lots came to be built and occupied. We have some good data of sort of filling in within the residential area over time, um, but uh, unfortunately we're kind of restricted to a certain chronological coarseness where just about all of the residential compounds and the, the monumental compounds are dominated by pottery from the same period, but that's a 200 year period, so getting more detail is hard. Yes. Just sort of following up on, on Wood's question, but at the other end of the spectrum, what do you know about the abandonment of the site? So that's a good question. The abandonment, I think I will jump forward to a slide here. So in, in this little slide, um, there's a kind of a barricade that's built around the site core. Um, that barricade is, is not very well dated, but by, by the late classic, we're talking, um, let's say, 8th century, um, there are only 20 architectural compounds that are, um, are, are inhabited. And these compounds are like this one here. So, big platform with lower structures on top. These, these late compounds don't have that same pattern of being encircled by um, house lot walls. In fact, they kind of disrupt the earlier pattern of house lot walls. So, um, and this, these, this later barricade, which is not that well dated, it, it definitely climbs over some of these middle classic uh, residential buildings that, are, that date to the, to, to, the, to the real peak of occupation at Chinchuk Meal. Um, there's a whole dissertation that addresses the transition from the middle of the classic to the end of the classic. That was uh, written by Aline Magnoni out of Tulane. She finished in 2008. And um, so the dissertation, her dissertation basically shows that it was a pretty sudden, not like, not like rapidly abandoned because there was a volcanic <coughs> eruption or anything, but, but we go from very heavily occupied to um, probably less than 2,000 people total within a span of 150 years. Um, and mo most of the later py pyramids are toward the site center. Um, so there's definitely interesting questions to be entertained about um, living in ruins, possibilities of historical memory. I don't know if that's, that's specific enough for what you're getting. Yeah, no, I mean, I was curious. Uh, I'm a southeastern archaeologist within the United States, and I the site of Moundville has this sort of political faction interpretation as well. Um, the different mounds are associated with different political factions, and when that becomes abundantly clear is in the order of their abandonment. Sort of someone gets to hold on for the longest and is sort of desperately wanting this place to continue to be, you know, the glory that it once was. And the political factions that sort of didn't have as much power are fading away kind of one by one and dropping uh -huh. out. And so I was just curious if there was any patterning in the abandonment of the spokes, you know, if uh -huh. some sort of disappear and are abandoned first, um, and then you sort of get it concentrated in the core. But yeah, yeah that was a good answer. Yeah, they do kind of, it does kind of concentrate into a, into a core, but in many ways it's a discordant layer mm -hmm. settlement. It may be continuous. We don't mm -hmm. have like a, t a total empty, un you know, unoccupied period. It may be continuous. But it's people building different kinds of houses with different spatial patterns and, and toward the core, not out toward the edges. Um, and again, with because of the coarseness of our chronologies, we don't we we because of how some of these um, because of how some of these walls are built, we can speculate about patterns of, of, of growth, mm -hmm. thinking that this compound here was built after this one because, because it, it, it seems to kind of, I'm not sure what the vocabulary is, but 
But this one kind of bulges into that one, as if this one was, as if this compound was already there, and then somebody decided to bud off in a way. And I, can, I can make a pretty specific argument for, for that, that, that chronological pattern for these two groups, because I've excavated most of both of them. But, but, it, but in terms of collapse and, and abandonment, we, we, we just can't say, because again, it's this chronology thing. You know, all of them, all these things, all these, these groups have some of the same ceramic wares, um, and then they, and then they don't. <laughs> so it's like, you just can't. That's an interesting question, though. Very interesting. Other than that. Yeah, Jamie. Um, yeah, maybe just sort of following up on the same theme. Um, here, so you have these like spokes that terminate in these monumental architectural complex that may be, you know, gathering points for ceremonies for these different barrios, um, and maybe homes of you know, social elites have type these different barrios. Um, could you talk about like why you think they might all, rather than being kind of like distributed like more evenly like throughout the site, clustered together around this hub, like why are these things all kind of cycling up on one another in the uh, center? Huh. Um, well, I could give a, a sort of a predictable answer to that question. Uh, predictable on the sense of, um, in the sense of dynamics of uh, site growth, so, um, it, you know, the, 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 the part of the site where we do have some of the earliest ceramics is from the site core. So, so it seems like over time the site kind of, kind of exploded from that center outward. Though there are you know, pieces of the, 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 the what, what's later called the residential core, there are pieces that have uh, earlier occupations. So it's possible that um, people who were at the site a little bit early um, were able to claim access perhaps to these very um, impressive salt works a little bit about 25 kilometers away on the coast or able to claim access to, 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 to something and parlay that kind of access to rich resources into um, um, higher status and so, which is to say that the people who were there first slowly develop into the, the most powerful people. And if they were there first, um, then, then they start out the center of the site. And, and later, people who came to the city had no choice but to expand outward, to, to settle away from the site core. So that, that's a kind of predictable answer, um, which, which I can't really um, evaluate. <laughs> uh, so, well, another way we can approach this question is um, to, to, there seems to have been some, the fact that all of these, most of these monumental compounds are networked to each other with these causeways suggests that there is some um, advantage to being at the, at the center and, and, and uh, in contact, you know, kind of, kind of part of um, the, 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 the major city center itself. So, um, so that's another possibility. Okay, the reason I just ask is um, because, I mean, this is all very, on my part, like, um, very speculative. If, you know, these, these monumental cores are, like, the low side of, like, power for these different factions throughout the site, one might be, one might question, um, oh, is it, you know, in kind of a functionalist way, like, this could potentially cause some problems if, you know, these factions have tensions with one another, then they're all clustered right around one another, it can foster them for the tension if that's already there. Uh, oh, so, I mean, their proximity, if, if they are in some kind of tension, being located close to each other might exacerbate that tension? Yeah, or, exactly. Okay. It's interesting. <clears throat> Take another question. That, that's kind of a Maya upon model, which is the idea of if you take all these sort of secondary elites, you sort of put them all together and put them really close together, so in fact, not so that there's more tension, but in fact, so you can control them. So, uh -huh. so keep them under your watchful eye of the guy who's in the, the lineage that's in charge. And I actually just want to sort of play off of that because sort of the question of the idea of neighborhoods is something, as you say, we've been thinking about for, for a while in the Maya area, having a hard time defining, and you've got some good archaeological features that allow you to, to define some of this. 
But what we've, what we've done in the past is to, to look, at the, look at, in some sense, the idea of neighborhoods tied to lineages and beginning to think about them less, although somewhat on an economic scale or other identifiable scales, also think about them in terms of both political and ideological connections of lineage being a political structure of some sort of powerful family that might control one of these neighborhoods um, or, or a couple of them but also thinking about them along a religious line of sort of saying the ancestors of those people are tied to my ancestors. And so within this neighborhood, it's an it's a, a identifiable zone that really is thinking about how we are tied to the, that lineage, both economically, structurally, politically, and religiously, and how that lineage is then tied to the, to the center. So you sort of have that sort of layering process that begins to work. And so my question in some sense is, are these compounds where you talk about with monumental compounds with for ritual gatherings, could they could they also be at lineage centers that are in fact both political and religious centers that both that tie outlying people to them and then themselves into the into the core? I think so. The one um, slight hitch is that beyond these monumental compounds, there isn't really a core. So there's, there's, there's one, I mean, these compounds are in the core, and there's one compound in particular that has, is larger than some of the other compounds. But um, I think a, a model that, that might be animating your line of argument here is what, what we see at Copan, right. where there's lineages, max, maximal lineages, that have their headquarters um, in different parts of the site. I'm just going to go to the Copan map since we got it here. So, for example, 9 and 8, um, in a very powerful lineage argued to be um, located here, but they are yet one step below the royal, the principal group at, at Copan. And so, oops, so at Copan it seems like we have um, at least three distinct levels. There's the level of um, uh, households and then there's the, 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 the major maximal lineage that they're a part of, and then above those maximal lineages, there's the principal group and um, the, 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 the royal dynasty. But at Chinchuk Mil, that topmost group is, is sort of stunted in a way. There's no single major architectural focus um, in the way that we clearly have at Copan. So, so I agree with you completely that these are not just political factions, but they probably have social, um, um, possibly even you know, clan type patrilineal connections, uh, but their tie to the set, but, but, but they, the model of political organization that I'm proposing here is that we have um, multiple, that we have multiple kind of possible ruling lines or factions as opposed to multiple lines that um, are underneath the main line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <coughs> sure. The question then is what brings them together and what, what keeps them together. And you talk, then you're talking about issues of you know, friction, competition, and or other type of uh, a glue that keeps them in, in one place. Mm -hmm. And what is, what is that glue? Ah, what is that glue? Um, that's a good question, but I, I don't think that it's um, the classic glue is argued to to integrate other Maya, classic Maya centers, which is to say the, the, the holy ruler, the Kulahao. Um, there's not an obvious candidate for a palace at this site. Uh, so um, Bruce likes to argue that um, that we have a marketplace in the center of this site that um, is connected to long distance trade as well as exploitation of the salt works nearby and that the draw of the city, um, despite the fact that it is marginal agricultural, is agriculturally marginal, that the draw of the city is economic factors as opposed to kind of political ritual factors. But I don't, I don't have great answers, you know, that, that's, go ahead. So on that, that particular point about, about economics, so you have this large city of th thousands of people living in a marginal environment, and 
you have wells, you have no river. And it seems like you've got a brain, a lot of brain, so, so how do you sustain populations of that size? What, what, how, are, how, how are people sustaining themselves? Is it through trade? Are they have, are you have, do you have evidence for some kind of agricultural system that's there? Or what, how, how do you understand the presence of the city in such an environment? Right. So the site is located at the edge of uh, several ecological zones, actually. There's a, if, 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 I already, if I had a, a more detailed map of this particular region, um, it would show that just to the west of the city, we have seasonally inundated swampland. Um, to the east of it, we have drier agricultural land. But those swamplands, some of it is estuary, some of it is savanna, may not have great food resources, but they have a lot of other kinds of resources, things like hardwood, things like thatch, um, salt, hunting resources, fishing. And so the model that we've come up with economically for how the people of Chinchuk Meal supported themselves was, it was, it was primarily based on um, two things. One is uh, taking advantage of all these resources that are not that common further in the center of the peninsula where Farming is a lot better, and, and second, we believe that they, well, based on the quantities of obsidian and other long-distance goods that are at Chunchuk Mila, compared to the quantities of long-distance goods at other sites nearby, we believe that they were a kind of a gateway center, a kind of an important part of the long-distance trade route. And they're, specifically these salt flats right here, this is, these salt flats are really pretty enormous, and we think that they actually were able to leverage these salt resources. There, is, there isn't a better salt source anywhere south of, of Chunchuk Meal, going all the way down to the, to, the, to the central lowlands. And so we think that they are able to exchange salt to get access to highland goods, things like obsidian, also pass that salt inland, uh, trade that obsidian with other folks inland, and, if, and they also, we also have good evidence of um, house lot gardens. So they're producing some food, probably maybe more than half of what they needed to eat, but maybe not all of it, and to, to, to supplement, to actually, well not to supplement, to, to complete the amount of food that they needed, um, these different economic uh, exchanges, I, I, I think, are what, what's doing it. So in terms of what, you know, who are they trading with, some of the best uh, farmland in Yucatan is about 60 to 80 kilometers away right here, and there's, um, there's much less pre-Hispanic settlement there. There's a good amount, but it's not, there's not a huge city right there. So we think that, that um, based on models of, of uh, well, models of subsistence exchange in um, Mesoamerican economies, that, that that's not an insurmountable distance to actually be um, trading um, bulk goods. This is good. So. Yes? Um, one way to look at it is in terms of population. I mean, the, the other way is the density. You had a table, a comparative table of four clusters according to both population and population density. Uh -huh. And there was a place called Shime, which had something like 6,000, uh, the highest of the population density. I was wondering if you related that to the market, uh, the, the density of markets and density of uh, political, uh, you know, places of power. Uh, was there anything like that you could explore? That's a, that's a, no, I hadn't actually thought of that very much. The, the, um, we've got what I think is very good evidence for a central marketplace. Um, which is located right here. Um, but marketplaces in Mesoamerica that are not permanent are very hard to find because they often don't leave many um, non-perishable residues. So it's, it's possible that some of these kind of open spaces that are interspersed around the city um, for example, here and here, could have hosted occasional markets. 
Um, but we, we just don't know. We, we've, done a, we, we've done some explorations of these non-built spaces at the site core, but we haven't really done excavations in any of these non-built spaces in the site periphery. So, so we, we, I, I, I unfortunately can't really, um, I, I can't get back at this question of the possibility of, of more markets being located within that sector of the site that's more densely populated, which is, I think, what you were asking me. Or, There's something which may be of help here, which was a work done by Professor Ian McCart at Landscape Architecture. It was called Sib Analysis. So what you do is, say, for instance, have a map of density distribution, mm -hmm. and, and then all these uh, the economic functions and the water holes, if they overlay them, and then you can have a better sense uh -huh. of how they are. So that could have been. Yeah, OK. Right, right, yeah. I could very easily make a density distribution to overlay yeah. it on the wells right. and see if there's a relationship. OK. Sib uh, analysis. What's it called? Sib analysis. S-I-V? S-I-E-V-E, as in a sib. OK. Design with Nature, Ian McHarg. McHarg? M-C-H-A-R-G. Okay, got it. He was chairman of landscape architecture at the School of Design. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sorry. Uh, in the absence of the, the typical royal palace complex and associated temples, uh, what's your latest thinking about how uh, the site may have been administrated on? particularly at this period when you, you have these very dynamic, dynastic, uh, major, uh, centralized uh, things that are around. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some models are ruled by council. Um, we don't, so there are, in other Maya sites, just for those who are not Mayas, there have been specifically Copan um, toward the end of the late classic period, a supposed council house has been excavated, um, which has been argued to, uh, on, on the building itself, there are potential toponyms that one person has made the argument these toponyms represent actual places um, in, within Copan and within Copan Valley. And so, and so this, this, this house up on the, the uh, within the principal group of Copan is a place where leaders um, came together. The, the, the council house is basically right there. But that that you know, looking more closely at those some of those toponyms, I think some of those toponyms are actual actual mythological places. So so um, there are some other examples of possible rule by council, which we see closer to um, northern Yucatan. Uh, at sites like Chichen Itza, but there's some, some of the same problems there, that this notion of multi Paul, sort of multiple um, kind, of, kind, of, uh, kind of leaders, but the epigraphy tends to kind of call that into question. But I think that it's, it's not completely impossible to have um, a situation where we have uh, administration by a group of leaders, perhaps one, perhaps took turns every 20 years. Um, there seems to be, you know, that the, the one group that's a little bit larger than the others has the site's only ball court. Um, and that's, that, that is a, as a, a possible, um, I'm not convinced that that's where the king lived, but, uh, but that's a possibility, uh, you know, uh, for kind of maybe a, now I'm getting, getting into an area that I've never talked about before and I'm gonna make a mistake, but there's some kind of rotating office Type organization, um, but you know we don't have um, any glyphs. Uh, we have some actual. We have a, a couple of primary standard sequences um, that just identify that just talk about the pots on which these these inscriptions are are found. But we don't have um, any um, art historical or epigraphic evidence that kind of illuminates a bit more about the political structure of this, uh, this area. Yes? 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with you about this, the, the kind of founder's principle. That, that's part of the, that, that was sort of the first answer I gave to Jamie's question in a way, that I, that I did think that there was that kind of effect. Perhaps some of the first people who were there um, <clears throat> became, you know, over time, uh, local leaders. So, um, You were also asking, I think you were asking about how we can um, perhaps chart the growth of each of these high pieces kind of over time. Is it, or maybe well, I misunderstood well, the question. I guess it would be if you maybe just take an assumption that these elite, or whatever they are, compounds, that not the ones that are near the center, but the ones that are scattered out throughout okay. the city, um, how, how did the landscape develop around them? might give you some indication of sort of the development of these connections with your pathways and the walls and things over a period of time. Yeah. Yeah, so we've, we've, we've looked a little bit at that, um, specifically trying to figure out, um, you know, look, looking more closely at the actual patterns of the stone walls to see how many places in the site can we infer um, the direction of growth, and unfortunately there's only about four or five spots around the site where it seems pretty clear that one house lot kind of butted off another. Um, and in those places where you can see that, we can't really go too far. So if I'm convinced that this group butted off this one. I'm also convinced of that because of a lot of excavation data that we have. But beyond these two, this is, uh, there's an open space here. Um, with regard to this third group here, I think it's um, hard to say what's going on, uh, you know, if this one came before or after that one. And so in those locations where we believe we have, that we can, we can make a strong argument that one group was built before another, it's hard to kind of extend that chain more than maybe two other groups beyond that. So, which is to say that most of these larger residential compounds throughout the site um, were not able to kind of link them into a, a developmental sequence. Just unsatisfactory, but alas, that's, that's part of the reality, I'm afraid. Well, I think we've run out of time. Thank you so much.